Welcome to MRTV's People in XR. This is the podcast that introduces you to the most exciting players in the industry. And here is your host, Sebastian Ong. Welcome to the very first episode of the People in XR podcast. This is a brand new podcast which will be published here on the MRTV YouTube channel as well as on all the major podcast services. In it, I'm going to interview interesting people in XR. I want to know what they do and how they got there. My name is Sebastian Ang and in this first episode, I'm going to interview Dr. Doom the co-founder and CEO of Live. In this first episode of the new podcast, People in XR, it is my utter pleasure to have AJ here, also known as Dr. Doom, the co-founder and CEO of Live. Hi, Dr. Doom, how are you doing? Hey, hey, how you guys doing? Very well, man. So happy to have you here on the first show of the People in XR podcast. So first, before we begin, let me tell you a bit about this podcast series. So it is, well, as the title says, about people in XR. So I want to get to know people in XR. I want to get to know what they're working on, the projects. But what I'm also really interested in is the people itself. So I want to, I want to get to know you, how you got into XR or mixed reality, in your case, totally mixed reality. And right, yeah, yeah, I would love to know more about you and the industry that you're working in. So for all of you who don't know Liv, so Dr. Doom is the co-founder and the CEO of Liv. And probably you can tell our audience what exactly Liv is. Absolutely. Um, most of you have probably seen some videos from Liv at this point. Uh, we put real people inside VR games and experiences. Um, the most obvious example here being Beat Saber. Um, the videos have been seen over 500 million times at this point. Um, and we provide the software to do this in real time. So primarily focused at VR content creators and VR streamers on Twitch, YouTube, Mixer, Caffeine, really, you name it. Incredible. So. I first got to know about Live really through Beat Saber, right? I think uh, Beat Saber kind of put you guys so much on 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 the map of 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 mixed reality. It was like fantastic to see those videos. It's like totally mind blowing. First of all, the game, right? Nobody knew yet. Um, nobody played it yet. It was just like the first time that we saw some footage, and then we saw that footage of people in that virtual reality, like slashing the blocks, and we were thinking like wow how does that work and well it only works because of you <laughs> right so th there, were, there were ways beforehand to do mixed reality traditional obs compositing interestingly enough the filter that people used was created by a cto before he joined live so All in right. a way we've always had a hand in, in mixed reality content <laughs> okay cool can you tell us can you tell us how exactly people can make these kind of mixed reality videos and why it's easier now with Liv and how it was before? Yeah, long story short is before you had to go through a series of seven to 11 steps um, doing manual compositing in OBS. Um, today, our compositor, the Liv engine, does this automatically for you. So in an ideal world, and I say that because VR is always a little bit shifty, um, but in an ideal world, you download Live, you install our virtual camera driver, uh, you do a single calibration where you click three times, one time at the camera, and then one time at each side of the corner, so we can decide and figure out the FOV of your camera. And then you can just launch a game that's supported by Live. To date, we have 88 games, I believe, under supported list, people who have our SDK, or games that have our SDK, and about 100 backwards palatable games. So, old Steam VR games made in Unity that uh, work retract. Wow, that is incredible. So the probability that my favorite game will work with Liv is very high then. It's very high and it's increasing by the day. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay, nice. So is, is it now uh, Unity only? If, if my game is made by another engine, I cannot use Liv and I have to no, wait? No. So we have both a Unity and an Unreal SDK. And then we also have specifications for if you have a custom engine. Uh, there's one game that I can't spill the beans on quite yet um, by a really big studio that is um, integrating the SDK or the specification of the... Come on, let's say it. Half-Life VR. I, I, <laughs> I, 
I, I wish. Let's put it that way. I, I really wish it was Half Life VR. I would be. I will. I will say. I would be surprised if eventually we didn't get Half Life VR. Okay. Only to make so much sense. Got it. Got it. Okay, so um, yeah, let's get back to the user experience. So I, I want to make this cool Beat Saber video, right? Where I am in Beat Saber. Mm -hmm. And um, so I need the game, obviously. I need Live. So Live is like a Steam download, I suppose? Yeah, it's a free download um, on Steam called the Live app. And you download it and install it. It's Perfect. Really That's nice. And you just mentioned um, the installation process. So you need me to um, use my controller and you need me to click where the camera is and um, like the, the, the sides of the FOV, the thing that the camera can see, right? Correct. Okay, but then um, will I also need a green screen? Yes, so yes. the additional hardware that you would need is either a green screen um, or a connect depth camera or depth sensor. Okay. So we can get the depth map and subtract the background uh, from the foreground or from the subject in this case. All right. Green screen is higher quality. Yes. Uh, the Kinect is uh, let's put less hardware that you have to buy, um, but you do get a bit of fringe on the sides. Uh, hopefully, the new Kinect that's coming out, Kinect V4, or they call it the Kinect for Azure, um, that's going to be baked into the HoloLens, will be much better. In fact, it will be much better, and we're very excited about it. Cool. So actually, um, Kinect, they're still coming out with new Kinects. I, I thought the whole thing was gone, was, was finished. <laughs> yeah, the Kinect is a work of Marvel. Um, it's unfortunate that it was released um, with not enough content to use it properly. It's sort of a happy coincidence that it turns out to be a great depth sensor for what we're doing, which was never their intention, obviously. Okay. Um, they are releasing a new one, and it's specifically for the new HoloLens, I believe at least. All so right. Connect for Azure, so look it up and uh, you'll see the specs. Okay, next cool. Well, I have an old Connect here, so this means I can perfectly use use your software. I mean, also I have a green screen here, obviously. So yeah, I should totally try it out. So after after yes, I will after this initial setup. Then so I, I used my controller to do these uh, to click to click three times. Mm -hmm. um, what what is going to happen then? And will will I need to have um, the Vive or the Vive Pro, or can I also do this with another headset with the, with the Rift or the with the Windows Mixed Reality headsets? So you can do it with virtually any headset that is on that uses Open VR, Steam VR, so okay. Pimax, Vive, Vive Pro, um, even Windows Mixed Reality. Although the setup is a little bit different there, or not different, uh, it's not as accurate. Uh, in All right. most cases, uh, mainly because of the different uh, tracking system they use. They use uh, inside out tracking. Exactly. Lighthouse tracking. Um, you can also use a Rift. Um, having said that, right now we don't support the Oculus native SDK. So you can only use Rift with games that run on OpenVR. Okay. Got we it. are working on it though. And oh. we will be releasing Oculus native very soon. Okay. Very cool. So after setup, what happens next? I am in Beat Saber now. And I want I want to record these these pretty videos. <laughs> you launch it through Live, so you have a drop down that is your game launcher. Uh, assuming you own Beat Saber on Steam, and you've done the calibration, then you just auto launch it mid work. Okay, cool. So I I just launch it in the Live app, and then everything is set up, and I just click on record in your app, or no. So we don't ever want to touch the recording and streaming part. You'd still use OBS for that. Okay. There's a lot of reasons for that. Yeah. Primarily because we're not uh, video compression and video streaming experts, and sure. OBS has already done it really well. There's no need to reinvent the wheel there. Oh, that makes sense. So, so simply, you would like uh, record the game as you always record the game, but everything now is in mixed reality. Correct. And nice. a, a, big, a big part of that is we know streamers and content creators are very particular with their existing OBS setups. Yeah, We've right. Exactly. Back before, so we don't <laughs> want to touch that. We know, we know we guys have done a lot of work and yeah. we want to let you. Yeah, it. like studios. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we yeah. made studios in OBS. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Oh, that, that's cool. Perfect. So, so the recording will still go through OBS. Yeah, that makes lots of sense. Cool. That is fantastic. So um, I believe that you are probably now um, the most, um, yeah, the, the biggest content, VR content creating app? That's yeah. right, yes. Like, um, can, you, can you tell us some numbers or some idea how many people are creating content or how many minutes of content had been created? I'm sure you have some metrics there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. So I can go sort of top down. Um, yeah. We have about 23,000 downloads on Steam. 
um, about 15,000 people who have downloaded the app and spent time in the app. And I think there's a cutoff that Steam takes. I think it's 0.8 hours. Okay. Um, then we have about 7,000 people who've come into our Discord and removed the warm. Those wow. are the people that we consider That is amazing. Users. That is amazing. Cool. It sounds small for no, but in this who doesn't work in VR. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> if you are in this industry, you will know that, hey, 7,000 active people who want to talk about this topic, that is amazing, right? We're still in the very beginning, and 7,000 is a very cool number. Especially if I, they're creating I, content right. with your app. That is, the, that is a great thing, right? That's right. I, would, I have to add, not all the 7,000 people are active. A okay. lot of people use it here and there. Um, we have... Ooh, uh, probably a hundred active streamers and content creators who use it regularly uh, as their main part of content. Yeah. And then people who like Draw with Jaza, who has a really big YouTube channel where he uses it times a month, create really specific types. Um, okay. And we expect that. We know it's not quite there yet for people to change their entire channel content, just BVR. Of course. Yeah. Not. But, uh, well, I think it, it just adds a lot of um yeah a lot of value to the streams and to the videos when you can see the real person right so when i'm in vr um uh, recording my gameplay well the, the 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 best thing that i can do right now perhaps i have some some face cam of me sitting in my living standing in my living room <laughs> yeah it's not so exciting but if the people are really in vr and you can see them hold something and the virtual thing is really in their hands i mean that's friggin amazing Right, and I yeah. believe you have much more. Um, do you have do you have some kind of metrics where you can tell, hey, there is more clicks if people use our app? Is there anything more? That yes. Yeah. So there is there's two parts to it. Anecdotally, obviously, we've seen the people who really doubled down on mixed reality content. They're seeing quite impressive growth in their channels. Uh, we've people who before we were around did have you know 50 to 100 views on their videos. And now they're getting in the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of views. Um, they're, they're far and few between. Um, they do definitely see a lift. A lot of it is also just lack of content in general. Beat Saber is probably the only game right now that's consistently streamed on Twitch and the videos created to YouTube. So we're sort of a synergy effect to the existing content out. If there's a great game out there that has lived, then that game will see uh, much more exposure as a result of using live. But we're only as good as the weakest link, in this case being the content. Okay. Um, having said that, uh, we are internally experimenting with what we call, and this is actually the second person who gets to find out about this. So there you go. Wow. Awesome. We, we, we call it Lib Game Changer API. And interestingly, we, we publicly announced this at the VR days where we sort of passed each other. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but Lib Game Changer API is an abstraction layer between all the streaming sites, Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, Mixer Caffeine, um, and the game developer, where they can build a real-time audience interaction t into their games. Okay, so cool. Running experiments with Beat Saber. In other words, when someone donates, follows, subscribes, posts, all the things you can do on Twitch, YouTube, things happen in game. And they happen not just like a 2D overlay, but things in the game change. Oh, that's so cool. That is it's incredible. Cool. Oh, that is so cool. Oh my goodness. Thanks for spilling the beans here on the People in XR <laughs> podcast. So yeah, so that will of course make the, 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 the viewers of that stream want to donate more or interact more with the stream, right? If they can yeah. somehow interact in game, something that the player can really see and well react to, oh, that is freaking amazing. Man, you guys are really smart guys, really awesome. I don't know if it's smart, but what we find is <laughs> we think audiences want to engage with their favorite streamers. Yeah. I think in many ways, people like Ninja and Dr. Disrespect today, the really big streamers, they have the same celebrity status as Beyonce and Snoop Dogg. Um, exactly, yeah. There, there's a layer of interaction that we're missing. Today, interaction is writing things in chat and hoping that they attend or donating money and getting your name on the screen. Exactly. But there's so much more we can do there. Yeah. In terms of data, because you asked me earlier, the people that we've been doing the experiments with, there is a handful of people in Discord that we usually roll new things out um, to. They are seeing between 2.5 and 4 times higher revenue per minute as a result. Wow. Of okay. Okay. Now I really need to download Lyft and do now something with it. Now you got me here. <laughs> so. 
but I really love this this new idea of being able to interact in the game, right? By by like interacting with like um, like donating or whatever. Could you give me like one example how this could actually look like? Absolutely. Um, I should have sent you a video in advance, but maybe <laughs> we can add it up. I can. I will add it later into the stream. Great. Um, so uh, important to mention, it's not just monetary based. So we okay. want people, we want it to be a sliding scale from free interactions that you can do just uh, on a cooldown, sort of a five minute cooldown where you can do something and still have fun in the stream to things where you donate or when you subscribe. Yes. Um, an example is uh, one of our free interactions. You type an exclamation mark bomb in the chat and then we replace one of the notes with a bomb. All right. And you just you don't know whether or not you're supposed to slice it. Oh, good. It it it, it does a lot. It, <laughs> it, people love that that type of interaction. Yes. Uh, another thing we do is when you donate uh, bits on Twitch, uh, we spawn what we call glitter blocks. Uh, so blocks have a bunch of confetti in them, the name of the donator, and it scales okay. it's based on the amount that you donate. So the more you donate, the more meaning. That. That's cool. Or like I, I can just think of something like, for example, if you are in in some kind of match or something, and you have some some virtual audience there, if you donate something, they would start to cheer like crazy, or something like this, right? You, there's qu quite a lot of ideas that game developers could come up with. That's right, and and our our, our goal is to turn audiences into participants. We almost think of it as almost building a game outside of the game, where right. you can in in, in the act. And ideally in a way that it's positive reinforcement. So when the yeah. streamer is struggling with a boss or when the streamer desperately needs a weapon upgrade, <laughs> the chat should be able to collectively come in and help the streamer out. Oh my goodness, this is, this is genius. Oh my goodness. Okay, guys, I need $50 to get this weapon. <laughs> Make it happen. <laughs> wow, this is incredible. This is really, really cool idea. And can you tell us again, what was the name of this new um, feature? It's fittingly called Live Game Changer API for two reasons, because it changes the game, but also <laughs> we think it's going to be changing for how people are interacting with. All really right. Okay, cool. Okay, the Live Game Changer API. When is it going to be live? Uh, we're running tests right now. Um, so we have a couple of developers that we're working with um, where we're experimenting and just seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, I think we'll have... Uh, an open an open invitation to developers to be in three phases. But don't hold me to this, please. <laughs> no, it's no, software, not. it's VR, anything yeah, can happen. Well, I know, I know. <laughs> but anyways, it's good that you're yeah, kind of far already actually with this, right? I mean like yeah. it works and you still have to do tests obviously, but it seems like you are already kind of far down the lane and probably we're going to see this in some streams soon. Oh my goodness. You're already seeing it. So there are a okay. bunch of, or a bunch. There's about five to 10 streamers who are already using it. And those are the ones that we're getting the data from. All right, perfect. Wow, that, that will make for some extremely interactive streams. Because yeah, sometimes it's, I'm, I still feel kind of disconnected from the people who are watching my streams when I'm in VR, right? So, okay, probably I have like OVR drop where I can look at the, at the chat sometimes, but still there's, there could be more interaction. Yes, absolutely. Nice. Do you think it would be possible somehow that um, like um, viewers could somehow um, record themselves and they could appear in my stream somehow in the game? Maybe. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, okay. Probably it's no, too crazy. No. It, no, it's not too crazy at all. It's a really good idea. I say maybe because um, there's a couple of things we don't quite want to spill the beans on yet. Okay. And then there's a lot of stuff that is just a technological challenge that if I said yes now and then we're held yeah. to it, um, it just ends up being a bad bad thing. But, sure. but yes, absolutely. But there's lots of things uh, wow, wow, happening in this whole streaming thing. It's, it's really exciting. This interaction, right? This interaction with the people out there is amazing. Yes. Cool. Game Changer API coming up on Live. Nice. So, um, yeah, very exciting. But I want to know a bit more about Live. I want to know... Um, with how many people are you working together? And very important, how did everything start? How did how did the whole the whole idea start? How did you build the company? Because you're one of the co-founders. Tell That's us right. the live story. The live story. So uh, a good friend of mine, Six, his name's last name is actually Live Six Live, um, approached me in San Francisco in early 2016. He needed a space to build a big green cube uh, where he was going to host a. VR esports Twitch show. 
And mm -hmm. I, I'm a former competitive gamer. It's partly where I got the name Dr. Doom from. Okay. Um, you so stream yeah. as well? I used to. In fact, we started out with Live. We started out as a, we started streaming with our tech. And one of the videos that I'm, I sent you earlier uh, shows some of our early streams. Okay, um, cool. But um, he wanted me to be the host for this VR esports show. And we started building the cube in, our, in my living room. And then well, we did one, two videos. I think the first video we did was I was standing topless, two Gatling guns attached to <laughs> my forearm in mixed reality, obviously, yeah. gunning down this massive boss. And we put it on Facebook and we realized this is people really, really, really engage with this. And they think it's really amazing. And in yeah, a way, at that time, it's like completely new, never seen before, probably. Completely. Well, or, Upload or VR new. had done some stuff. Yeah, Upload VR had done some mixed reality, okay. uh, tilt bar okay. stuff. All right. uh, and Six, in fact, was helping them back then. So he was sort of the go-to mixed reality guy in many ways lives on the hardware side. Um, and interestingly, we were using our CTO's filter to do this with, before he, we even knew of him. Um, okay. So that, that's sort of the full circle story with how we got our CTO to join us. But we can get into that later here. Um, but yeah, long story short, we put out some videos, and next thing you know, uh, we had a bunch of companies who wanted us to do mixed reality for them. We did an activation at CES with Audi, and upload. Did some some other cool projects, and uh, in 2017, we joined TechStars, which is a startup accelerator in Los Angeles, or the, the branch in, that we was in Los Angeles. Angeles. And that was about the same time that our CTO joined us, Stefan or Ru, as we call it. We, we call ourselves only by gamer names in turn. Um, and we're really <laughs> religious about it to the point where yeah, that's why and investors do the same. Wow, really? That is yes, so of interesting. Course. Of course. <laughs> okay, I <laughs> shall call you Dr. Doom. I, I mean, in, in the short talk that we had before this show, you told me, hey, better call me Dr. Doom. <laughs> okay, man. That's, right, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. cool. <laughs> well, even, even your investors call you Dr. Doom, man? Absolutely. No, man, absolutely. that's incredible. That is yeah, so absolutely. incredible. It has to be that way. We're, we're, we care a lot about culture. Okay. And I think in, in many ways, it's why we have such a dedicated following. Is people know that we're just one of them. We just happen to be built something that we are using ourselves and that we're sharing with other people. Um, oh, so man. it's worked really well and we want to double down. That is so funny. I can just imagine how must be your, your talk with the, with the investors and the investors ask you, hey, Dr. Doom, what are your That's main metrics? <laughs> You know, like this? Oh man, that is really, and, and, really funny. You know, in many ways, you get a self-selecting group of investors who sort of resonate on that level too. So okay, it, it works sure. really well as a filter and as, yeah. a, as a culture build. Okay, nice. So what did Techstars do for you? Was it good for you? Was it like a great experience that, that, that pushed Live forward? Yeah, so Techstars is excellent. Um, yeah. we, we were 10 companies. They brought a bunch of resources, anything from mentors to interested investors. Um, to just workshops and helping you think around the business. Having said that, we were probably a little bit too early. For, we, we hadn't really built the product yet. We had a green cube and we could do mixed reality compositing the old way. So right. we came in on the promise that we would build the software and then we would build a community around it. Back then we were three guys in Discord. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so, you, you, so had, you had never met each other, the other people or? Stefan actually joined us um, from the UK. He, he'd never left Europe before. Okay. He flew out to LA to live with us and meet us for the first time and start work. <laughs> wow. Exciting, man. And then the accelerator life, right? Yeah, it was three months, um, pretty intense, or rather, you know, really intense, but yeah. in a good way. You're surrounded with really smart people. Of course. You get to work on the stuff you love. Um, and then we had demo day in October 2007. Closed a little bit of money right after about 300,000 and we've been living on that since, so until 2008. Right. So, um, uh, so since you come out of, uh, tech stores, you got that 300,000 investment and you guys are, I mean, you are located in Prague, right? Yes. We moved here four months ago. Oh, wow. That is incredible. So tell, tell me why, why did you move to Prague? Are you, are you from Prague? I'm not, I'm from Sweden originally. All right. Um, we, we moved to Prague because one of our engineers, uh, Mystery, um, is Czech. And okay. he also happens to, that, that's how he got the Beat Saber integration. They're also a Czech team. And Mystery used to work with the CEO of Beat Games, Jaroslav, uh, in a different company. And when they were releasing the game, he thought it would be a great fit. So it was super organic. Um, 
but he has a family and we don't. We're young. We're, we're happy to move around. So instead of asking him to uproot his life and join us somewhere else in Europe where we were consolidating the team, we just moved to Prague. And wow. it worked out really well. Cool. How do you like it in Prague? I love it. I, yeah. one, thing, one thing we've noticed is every time we move, we've moved quite often at this point, but every time we move, we get a chance to improve ourselves a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. erase some bad habits, um, get uncomfortable together, and it, it sort of builds a really strong team ethic and uh, really strong bonds internally. So we want to do more of it. We're hoping to do a couple of moves every one year. Oh, really? Cool. That is really, really interesting. I think that's a good point that you make there, that it will even like strengthen the bonds, right? If you go through these kind of moves, you always have to yeah, get to know the place around you again, probably a different language. Yeah, that kind of will bond you together. Nice. And I think Prague is really, really an awesome city, not just because it's beautiful and the beer is not expensive and all these things, but also in terms of um, VR, there seems to be quite a lot of things going on, right? Yeah, um, there's this misconception, or it's not a misconception, but there's idea that most of the great tech comes out of San Francisco or Silicon Valley. Yeah. And in, in most areas, it's, it's true, or in many areas, it's true, I should say. I think VR is a one area where that's just not the case. Um, point in case, the you know biggest game of all time is from Prague, Saber. Um, I think we're doing pretty well. We're in Prague. Right. Um, and then we have the Xtal guys, VR engineers, who are building excellent headsets for B2B enterprise solutions, um, who are also there around the corner. I mean, I met you there. Uh, exactly. There, there, right. Uh, plus, Wow, it's it's really interesting in terms of VR, right? It, also here with the with the YouTuber scene, like MRTV, right? I'm here in in Germany in Dortmund. Right. Then then Nati, he is in Holland, and lots of other great YouTubers, VR YouTubers, are actually here from Europe. So That's I right. think it's it's pretty interesting, right? That is not this time. It's not just so concentrated on on the valley, but it's more it's more um, global, which is kind of cool. But I still think, right? If you want to get the investment and stuff the best place should still be the valley, right? What do you think? It's a really good question. There's absolutely a higher density of people with money in San Francisco and in the <laughs> Valley. And I say that not as in, as in individuals, but institutional money as well, uh, especially institutional money. Um, in, in many ways also, you are competing with more companies. So although there is more access to capital, there's also higher competition and, and, and you're sort of playing in the A-League over there. Um, right. We've raised both in the Valley as well as in Prague for this current round fundraising. Um, and I can't really say which one is easier or harder. It's, you know, we were a very different company back in 2017 than we are today. So right. it's not really apples to apples, but, but generally I would agree with you. It's cool. probably easier to raise in the Valley. Probably. But so you're still living from these 300,000 and probably soon it's going to run out and then probably soon it's about getting to the next round, right? Correct. So we're closing off our current round now. Um, we, and, and this is something that I think our community really knows about us, but we love to live frugally. We're not really in it for the money. We're in it. We love doing what we're doing. So our goal isn't to take a high salary and sort of live lavish. We try to pay ourselves as little as we can, make sure that we invest in the right things at the right time. Perfect. You know, 300,000 on between four to six people we've changed size over time has been more than enough for us. Nice. Yeah, I mean, this kind of money actually would be gone pretty fast if you would stay in the valley, right? Absolutely. Um, also, depending on your spending habits. So, I mean, there are companies out there, without mentioning any names here, who've raised double-digit millions and managed to burn through it. Partly, I think, due to over-optimism in the market, and over hiring as a result of it, um, or just investing a lot of money into into engineering. Got it. Yeah, it's expensive. So yeah. at the moment, how many people are you now, your team? We are four, four people. So it's Great. myself, uh, Ru, our CTO, Ministry, who is our lead Unity engineer and graphic type engineer, and Socks, David, uh, in San Francisco, who does all the depth sensing stuff. Okay, right. You know what? I still love. I just love it that you're using your game names. Damn! I wish I was a ga- more of a gamer to give myself a name like this that I would use all the time. Well, Sebastian, <laughs> yeah. now, that, now that I have you on on this call here, what is your gaming? Oh, what is my gaming name? Well, actually, yes. I'm using Insomniac. 
So you can use Insomniac, man. <laughs> I'm gonna call you Insomniac. Okay, perfect. Okay, Doctor Doom, <laughs> let's keep let's keep on with this. Okay, so um, I want to know now um, how the money question, right? So you are a startup and you are talking with investors. Investors want to know, show me the money. They want to see the money. So so how are you going to um, generate money? So uh, let's take a step back. I think some investors want to see how you're going to make money. All right. Other investors want to see where you're going to be, why you're going to be a big company in five years, um, or what is it you're solving for on a vision or mission basis that they well, really resonate with. Right. That are the best investors. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's just so hard to judge. Uh, it, it all depends on your business and, and what you're trying to do. In our case, we were really aware that we weren't going to drive the revenue short term. We're, we're sort of a long-term play where we believe VR is the next platform for gaming. As a, as a core gamer, I, I truly believe that, and our team truly believes that. Same as here. a result, we think, and of course, I mean, as a mixed reality TV right here. Yeah. Um, and as a result of it, we think uh, over time, we'll see VR streaming and VR concentration really balloon. And I, th I still think it's two, three years out, and we can talk a little bit about where the market is today. Um, right. But it's, it's a, no shadow of a doubt in my mind that it is going. And we're just doing the work today to position ourselves in poke for when that big wave hits. Right, right. I think that's true for so many of us in this industry, right? We all know, okay, at the moment, it's like the tough times, like... None of us is making lots of money, actually, right? But we know at one point people will understand, hey, the gaming in VR is just like so much better. I mean, we know that, right? But but most of people, they're still playing their Fortnites and they think this is the most awesome thing ever. But once they go inside and at one point they will go inside, they will find out. And at this moment in time, okay, then people like us have positioned ourselves in this industry and then hopefully... Yeah, it's business, also in terms of business, things are going to be interesting. <laughs> Let's say it like this. Exactly. So lots of things are about positioning ourselves right now. So, But still, I would still, I would still like to understand a bit more how exactly are you going to earn money from Lyft. So tell us a bit more about the business model. Yeah. So short term, uh, we're monetizing on what we call Live Share. LiveShare is an automatic clipping and social sharing software that we sell to arcades and malls and kiosks. Anyone who's doing a location-based VR. Um, our first partners are Exit Reality, I'm sure you've heard of, and Springboard VR, who build arcade management software. We're actually, I say we, uh, but our tech is at IAPA right now in Florida, being right. demoed new hub. Exit called the X-Hub, which is the two-player mixed reality booth they mm -hmm. sell to out-of-home um, locations, out of home entertainment locations. Uh, we charge, it's a really simple model, we charge $1 per video, and then the location can either choose to eat that up as a marketing cost, where guests can get their video for free, or they can go with the roller coaster model, where okay. they charge $5 for the video, for the guests to take it home, and then we charge them $1, and they make it all. That is great. That is a great business model. And actually, no, that's the first time that I hear about this. I, I was totally not aware that you have this kind of business model. I thought it would be something like, okay, you take a cut of the money that the streamers will earn or something when they use your software or something. But that makes lots of sense. So we are absolutely going to do that. And okay. I wouldn't say taking a cut of the streamers money as much as um, we're going to open up hopefully in the next six to months, um, we call our the live marketplace. We want to power audience engage through our own currency, not an ICO, just a regular digital currency. Um, it's going to be a hard currency and a soft currency. The difference being live gems being a hard currency, you pay dollars or your own currency to buy live gems. And All then right. live being coins that you earn just by staying in the chat and interacting with the stream. And they'll okay. power different types of engagement. Um, but that's where we will make money long. All right, that that makes sense. So, so wh what kind of app store is it? What what kind of things um, can I buy in that store? Is it it's for the live application? Something that makes the live application more interesting. It's primarily for audience to interact with their streamers. So today, if you donate on Twitch, you cheer with bits on Twitch. Uh, you're using Twitch or using your own using Streamlabs. Don't 
Right. We want people to play the game, so to say, through Live and do it with Live Coins and Live Gem. That's okay. step one. Step two for us is, and I should have sent you a video more, but <laughs> we, we realized a couple of months ago that games have avatar assets. So if you're playing, that's a good example. If you're playing Overshot, which is a 3v3 archery game, the, uh, the character you're playing has a helmet. Mm -hmm. And we figured out that by adding a couple of effects, you can make that helmet look like it's on top of your head. Same with right. shoulder pad, body <laughs> armor, and gloves. Yes. Um, and I'm a former, I'm, I played mostly competitively, I played World of Warcraft. World of Warcraft is all about putting items on your character. That's what the whole game is about. <laughs> right. So we want streamers and audiences to be able to equip themselves with virtual assets. So that'll be step two. And then step three is selling games. Cool. Selling games in, in your app store, like, right. like VR games, just like uh, competing against uh, Steam VR and uh, Viveport. Yeah, well, I, competing, I think it's more complementary. And All the right. only reason we've been thinking about this is people are already coming to us today, offering us a really heavy discount on their keys for us right. to sell them for them. Right. So, natural progression of what's happening in our Discord. Okay, cool. Very interesting. So overall, the, the big question always like, where do you see the project live in five years? <laughs> yeah, that's a tough question. I know, man. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> that's why you're asking. Them, exactly. right? I, I think before I answer it, I think well, I tell investors too, I think we need to be humble enough to know that we don't know everything yet and that it's uh, ever changing and we should keep ourselves agile enough to be able to react to whatever we think is right in the industry. Um, having said that, you know, again, our team is core gamers and former competitive gamers and live streamers. Our CTO at least was one of the biggest live streamers in VR for a while. Now he works to do that bit more. Cool. Um, but we want to power VR esports and, and VR content creation at scale. If you're streaming VR um, or if there's a VR competitive event going, we want those events to use live. Great. That is. That sounds incredible. Um, so you want to be like the app, the software that no streamer can live without, and that is basically like uh, yeah, a must-have for every streamer in order to monetize their streams better, to interact with their viewers better, and simply have a better streaming experience. Is that it? Correct, and it involves a lot of things, but. Mixed reality being one of them, bringing feature parity from regular streaming to VR. So things like scene control, having chat in your HMD, having notifications in your HMD, all these things that we take for granted in regular PC streaming don't exist in VR. Right. So we're releasing a lot of small tools to help streamer today and putting that all under the live umbrella. Cool. So definitely for every streamer who's watching this here right now, you have yes. to download Live. You have to try it out and yeah, and simply use it and make your streams much more exciting. Cool. So Live is really a super exciting, exciting app. And uh, yeah, I will definitely try it out very, very soon. So, awesome. so that kind of like um, com completes the part where we talk about Live. Now, the other two parts are going to be we're going to talk a bit about the industry your take on the industry we've already heard a bit but i still want to hear a bit more and then i want to hear a bit more about you dr doom i want to understand a bit more how do you, how you got into this whole thing and yeah some some more personal personal stories i would like to get to know you as a person dr doom working in that exciting xr industry so let's start with 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 the industry Your take of where we are right now in VR in 2018, at the end of 2018, where do you see the industry right now? I think I'm going to use words from no, none other than Palmer Lucky. Mm -hmm. He said something that I find really insightful. He said, even if VR was free today, people wouldn't use it. And I think I agree with that. And I want to clarify. Um, what he's saying is there's no returning engagement. In other words, even though I have a VR headset and people in our Discord have a VR headset, um, most people don't use VR for their day-to-day -day game all the time. So that's the same thing for me. As, as much as, as passionate as I am, at the end of a long day, at 11 p.m., I 
don't necessarily hop into VR to play Standout or, or War Dust or any of the other games that I really love them. Uh, sometimes I just want to sit on my computer and play an RTS. So there is there is a whole range of things that need to be improved. Everything form factor, content, uh, to you know, there's too much to mention as the <laughs> graphics, you know, uh, gameplay. Uh, the ho- the whole range needs to get better. Um, so I think we're still really early, and I think that's a good thing, both for people like you and for people like me, because of what we said earlier. Right, right. So that is a very interesting take that you agree, totally agree with what Palmer Lucky said that, well, it needs to be about the engagement coming back to VR and there has to be simply, yeah, there has to be more that, that keeps people coming back to these experiences, right? And we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And, and interestingly, if you take a deep look at what's happening in the market, there's all these building blocks people are working on that will eventually converge into what I think is going to be 50 million headsets worldwide, right? Right. I would say is, is, is a good benchmark for mass adoption. Right. Anything from eye tracking to uh, better ergonomics, better form factor. Um, I don't necessarily think that untethered is the, the future for core gaming. I think those two are going to stay separate for a while. Mm-hmm. The best argument for that is NVIDIA isn't going to stop me. Killer graphics <laughs> right exactly Martin does not want the best experience right whether that's through tethered or through streaming from a pc to a headset it's up for discussion We've seen some interesting streaming solutions but i do think that that's going to stay pretty separate yeah i agree for some for some time but i think at one point in time simply all all, all everything will be streamed into your headset from the cloud from the edge cloud or so and then probably it's not going to come from that big box <laughs> that we have standing here under our desktops yeah at one point it will come definitely but i agree with you at the moment it's still going to be like yeah parallel um when do you think is it going to happen that there are so many experiences that are so good that would completely make people come back to VR every single day? Question. It's a great question. Um, I think there are dev studios out there, and I'm going to mention one here, and that doesn't mean that there aren't other, just to clarify, but companies like Servios who make exceptional. Servios are masters of transporting from your living room or wherever you're playing into this new world, end-to-end, um, with excellent play. Um, they're going to continue making it, and eventually they'll make uh, the kind of game and the right time is going to get people to buy more headsets. Um, companies that we look up to today in PC gaming as sort of the North Star, Blizzards, the CD Project Reds of the world, you know, their game cycle or the game creation cycle is three, five, seven years. So assuming they start making a VR game today, we're probably not going to see it hit the mark for three, five, seven years. Probably more in the five-year mark or five-year uh, gap. So, I would say three plus years for the indie devs of today to start making triple A licensed, um, and we'll see more headsets being sold as well as all the things about earlier. But probably five years, five six years before we're seeing headsets out. Wow, we have to keep strong. <laughs> Until and, we reach and, that and point, be honest, and yeah. be honest, and 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 sort of not be over promising, because I think that's happened in the past, and people, as a result, have gotten really burned. You're right. Agreed. I I also agree with you. I think yeah, three to five years for sure, and then probably we're going to see that kind of mass adoption. But you know, right now it's really for these big studios, it's not worth it to invest millions into into VR games when the numbers are simply not there, right? At the end, it's still a business. And uh, yeah, why would a big company spend so much money in, in, in a VR game only when they will not make money from it? So yeah, yeah. but Absolutely. in that respect, I would say even if the, if the VR headsets were free right now, then at least we would have this huge mass of people who would be able to buy games so in that respect, I would disagree with Palmer Lucky. So it would probably take a while until then everybody has these experiences, but it would definitely help with studios making better games if everybody Absolutely. could get these Absolutely. headsets for free. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Right. Cool. So um, 2018, yeah, now what's going to happen? What's going to be the big thing in 2019? What do you think? 
next year. <laughs> Other well, than live game changer okay. API. Sure, of course. Yeah, of course. Well, I'm not I mean, gonna chill my own product here. Exactly. Um, <laughs> if we're to trust the Valve leaks that came out recently, this week, um, I think the big thing for 2019 will be a Valve AD that uh, uniquely that comes out uniquely with two or three titles that Valve has confirmed they're working on, um, and that natively uh, leverages. I think uh, we have we have uh, the knuckle. I think I can say. I think we have the knuckles um, at, at our office. And how are they? I, no, I, I can definitely say it now. That's <laughs> coming back to me. <laughs> and they're they're great um, in terms of the potential. Unfortunately, when you use them for games today, the games aren't developed around the knuckles. So gripping doing this or gripping pressing a button is virtually the same. All um, right. And we'll, we'll need to wait for probably Valve to show people how to develop around the nose. Or potentially uh, stress level zero. They've been doing some really interesting stuff. I have big faith in them developing something really exciting. Cool. So um, you think that the Valve headset should it come is going to be the biggest thing in VR in 2019? Yes, and only because it'll probably come bundled with some Valve exclusive games. Yeah, could probably be Half Life VR. I mean, it, it just make it just makes sense, right? Please, Gaben, <laughs> Gaben, God, Gaben, please, if you hear this podcast, please, yes, release please, Half -Life please, VR, please, please, Lord Gabe, oh, do man. release that. Yeah, hopefully he's he's listening to this podcast or watching it. He better be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's Gaben at ValveSoftware.com if you want to send. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does get some email with this kind of content in it, <laughs> quite regularly, I suppose. Sorry. Nice. So, um, what do you think? What is your take on on something like the Oculus Quest? Um, it's a great piece of hardware. It's, you know, it's got inside-out tracking. It's untethered, so that comes with a certain amount of limitations. Um, and I, again, I think here it's really important to be really honest about where the market is. So don't expect that it's going to be savior of the industry. It's definitely not going to be the <laughs> okay. same. It is, I think, in many ways, a gateway drug to VR. I think a lot of people will buy the Quest and they'll get to experience room scale, six, off the, uh, six degrees of freedom, virtual reality for the first time, especially people who got into VR in 360 video era with a phone strapped on their face. Yeah. Um, so they'll do that and then they'll say, holy shit, this is amazing. I'm in 3D space in a virtual world. And then they'll want more. And they'll hopefully, our hope is uh, buy a heavier PC and experience some of the better experience. Right, right. I, I believe it's going to happen. I mean, it's going to be incredible, right? People trying this out for the first time, six degrees of freedom, amazing. But then probably they'll, they'll find out, hey, I want to play Skyrim. Hey, I, I want to play Fallout 4. I want to play uh, Blade and Sorcery or whatever. Right? And, and all these games, they won't be able to play. It's a it's a Snapdragon 835, right? So it's going to be tough. Probably streaming will work. We don't know yet about that. But I agree, um, yeah, people are going to want more, hopefully. And then hopefully if the Valve HMD is going to be sold at cost, what I believe they're going to do in order to strengthen their, their, their software sales and hardware sales, that might be really, really exciting. They might even sell it at a slight loss. I mean, Valve yeah. makes a, a metric kind of money from Dota to CSGO mm -hmm. um, and the marketplace. So I think they can afford being a loss leader there. Right. The heads. right. Talking more about streaming again for the industry, in general so obviously now the flat gaming is completely dominating streaming yeah there's no question i, I think the vr streaming it's like it's like 0.1 percent or what it's like ridiculous it's less it's, it's less, less. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, less. it's way less yeah it's it's, yeah. it's like nothing but um we've been just talking about it and your take was probably in five years vr is going to be mass market what in your opinion how many percent of Twitch streams would be VR games in five years. Oh man, you're throwing me these curveballs. Okay, yeah, I so <laughs> I think the way to look at it is from a streamer's perspective. A streamer's job is to entertain their audience and grow their audience. So if in five years 
VR gaming provides something to the audience that you can't get, in, then I think we'll see a pretty big shift. Um, I don't think regular PC games are going to go away. So to be on the safe side, say in five years, it's 30, 37%. 30%? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to give up because I know I'm just pulling it straight out of my ass here. Um, <laughs> in five years, I will totally pull out this video and throw in your face. So be careful. I know. I know it's the internet. <laughs> Nothing goes away. Exactly. Uh, I live on Reddit and Discord, please. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, I think that's a tough one. I think, let, let me put it this way. When Ninja and Dr. Disrespect just use the names that everyone knows here, yeah. decide to stream VR, that's when everyone's going to switch over. Okay. And they'll only do that when they have proof that their audience grows as a result. And probably they will even earn more money thanks to that. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks again. Yeah, right. Probably right. once they once they use Live Game Changer API, then things are looking good for everyone <laughs> in this industry. That's cool. hope. Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. So I think that was a really interesting take on the industry where we are now and where we're going to be like in a couple of years. And now the last part of this people in XR podcast is more about Dr. Doom about you. I want to know a bit more about how you became Dr. Doom. <laughs> oh, so uh, it's, it's, it's really straightforward. Um, yeah. I'm a huge nerd. Uh, yeah, of course. We all are. I think. We all are. Obviously. Um, I love video games. I've loved video games my whole life. And uh, I started playing as a scrub and then eventually leveled up to be pretty okay. And then I got really good at games. One of the video games I was really good at was called Marvel vs. Capcom. Okay, right. Which is a arcade fighting game. It's a 3D, right. 3D. There are three Marvel characters, Capcom character, a combination of the three. And you fight some other person, hopefully with the outcome that you get to drink their salty theories um, <laughs> because they lose. And right. the character that I played primarily was Dr. Doom. And so, um, you know, I showed up at some local tournaments and made friends online primarily, but also friends offline at those tournaments. You know, one thing leads to the other and then people call you. Got it. So cool. I the money for all my games. Makes sense. Makes sense. And now I would like to understand how did you become the founder of a mixed reality startup? So you told me you, um, you, you originally come from, from Sweden. Yes. And um, are you like a, a technical person? Did you study, I don't know, information technology or what do you do? <laughs> uh, so I studied mechanical engineering and at King's College in London, 2009, I started that. I'm, I'm 29, by the way. All right. Mm -hmm. Where I'm at in life. And uh, I got to say, I probably have never used my degree besides sort of the logical problem solving part of it. Um, I spent uh, a year in San Francisco doing an MBA, and then I started first company called Fitness, a marketplace for first training. F uh, tell, say again, sorry, I didn't get it. You, a fitness company? Yeah, it's a fitness company. It was a marketplace for personal training. All right, okay. So uh, helping people both find the right trainer they don't have access to people that need in their life, as well as uh, surrounding resources to really get them on the right path to a happier and healthier version of themselves. Great. Um, I was in San Francisco in 2012, and in 2013, we shut that down for a few reasons, but primarily because it wasn't a really big market. And the other reason, which I find uh, in retrospect, a really good learning lesson for other people who potentially want to get in creating their own products. Uh, we made a lot more revenue before we had the app than after we launched. Really? Was, How is yes. it possible? Well, we did everything manually on Excel sheets, and it was really high touch. So we realized that a lot of the reasons people came to us was kind of the same reason people go to doctor um, for diagnosis. Right. It, it's an interpersonal business. It's not as much going on an app and picking someone. Got it. Um, and when we launched the app, that's what happened. Our revenue dropped pretty quickly. And we figured that A, it's not a scalable business. And B, because it's not a scalable, it ends up being a new small market. And so that was the time that we decided that well, we're going to cut that focus. Right. I mean, most of the time, if you fail, then you learn so many things. So you got to fail. I mean, that's the mantra, right? In the valley, like it's, it's good to fail. 
fail fast so that you can learn lots of things for your next venture and in your next venture probably you won't do the same mistakes again so that's fantastic so you for yourself you always felt like you want to build things you are a, a startup guy is it like this yeah i i think i look at myself as a product and communications guy i love interacting with people and and and, and building products that people love um i think we finally have that would live and that's part of why it's so motivating is seeing people use your product and coming into discord and telling them or telling us all about how much they love the product how much them. um so that that's how i position myself um i usually tell investors that i'm a really big mouthpiece to three really smart <laughs> and in many ways i think that's true right you know my job is to communicate uh, with the right people the right message at the right time and uh, empower my team and get out of the way great really nice so you said like um, you love it when the customers the users come to you and when they tell you hey dr doom I, i love live it's incredible you have changed my streaming life and is that what drives you that would be my next question is that what, what drives you what what makes you wake up in the morning and what what makes you to yeah to to work these long hours that you probably work as well Yeah, we definitely work long hours, but in in many ways, you know, we 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 really do love what we do. So for us it feels it feels less it's definitely sometimes feels like work, but it feels less like work than if you hate your job. Um I think for us and I I speak not just for myself, the rest of the team here. Um what what drives us is a a a, a core belief that VR is going to be the next gaming platform. Um and this appreciation and gratitude for being in a position where we get to work on sort of really push the industry forward. And, and you you know this better than anyone, uh, Insomniac. Um, <laughs> I know, you, you're going to get... Um, but you know this better than anywhere. Mix or VR is so small now that everyone kind of knows each other. We right, know that exactly. In five, in five, ten years, we're going to look back at this period and say, these were the good old days. You're right. And there's something about that that just feels really rewarding. Really you're right. Rewarding. You're right. We're in the early days and it kind of feels so interesting at the moment that things can change so fast. And just like you said, it's so small. You know everyone when you go to these like VR days and you exactly see the same people who are like pushing their style of companies. And it's it's just amazing. Actually, it feels kind of magical right now. Don't would yeah. you agree? I totally agree. And in many ways, we wouldn't be able to do what we do today if it wasn't so Yeah. Because some big company with a lot more resources would be trying to solve what we're solving. Um, fortunately, like you said earlier, companies like Facebook and companies like Vive are investing heavily in the ecosystem and not just in their own closed walled gardens. So one of our investors in this round is Vive or Vivex, their accelerator arm, their venture arm. Um, but also Oculus has given out plenty of dev grants to open source projects. I think Oculus gets a bad rap for being associated with Facebook, but they're really doing an exceptional job at both promoting content and funding content, but also funding tools, utilities like ourselves uh, to do the job that we have to do. Totally agreed. Totally agreed. So, yeah, actually today, you know, I'm doing the news on MRTV and there was one news item. Liv is in the next batch of the HTC Accelerator, right? That's right, yeah. That's incredible, man. Congratulations. I was really happy when I was reading that. So does it mean that you, you get a move to, to London for three months? No. And, and Vivex is, uh, has matured a little bit since the first batch. Um, they realized that in VR, companies come in at vastly different stages. And bringing people in to do workshops about fundraising or how to run your finances doesn't really make sense for them. So it's really just a, a cash investment and then six months worth of heavy access to resource. So right. we've been with Vivex for two weeks now. I just came back from London last week and they've already started pulling their weight and then some. All so right, okay. Early access to hardware, um, early right. or access to Vive studio games, that kind of stuff, just really hands-on. Okay, that is that is really cool. Anyways, we wanted to talk more a bit more about you now. So you, you grew up in Sweden, right? In That's Stockholm right. or where? Yeah. Okay, nice. And um, actually, I think when we met last time, you also spoke German with me, actually, like like very fluently. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Tell me a bit, why, why do you speak um, German fluently? I, I lived in Germany when I was uh, seven or six. 
two, nine, three years. Oh, I did, really? Uh, year one, three in Germany. Okay. And then when I came back to Sweden, it just made sense to Germans. So I actually have my Abi in Sweden, or in, sorry, in Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> Sweden. <laughs> all the time. Right, in, right. In Sweden, um, and then came out to San Francisco right now, or to London and then San Francisco. Oh, wow. Incredible. And um, yeah, so, and then London, San Francisco, and now Prague, but you don't speak Czech by any means. I don't. I'm, I, I had high hopes to actually get my ass in gear and learn it. But it's, it's very I, tough, I heard, I think. It's tough. And I found two things. One, I had to do very little to learn my other languages because I grew up like a sponge, you know, when you're a young kid. You of course. Up. Now that I'm turning into an old man, it's significantly <laughs> harder. Um, right, right. And I just need to make some more time for it. But I do, I do want to at least leave Prague with a baseline understanding. Okay. Do you already know where probably the next um, the next city is that you you and Liv are going to make your headquarters in? Yeah, uh, we would love to go to Amsterdam. We had <laughs> oh, man, it's gonna be tough to work there. You think? <laughs> yeah, man. You, I, the distractions, the weeds, I, the I girls. Mean, so <laughs> For one, I lived in San Francisco five years. So if weed was a distraction, I would have not been, able, <laughs> been where I am today. Um, okay, right, right. But, but more importantly, it's a beautiful city. It I love, I love it. A lot, a lot of buzz in terms of tech and IT. They, they, they get that part really yes, well. Yes, yes. And then most importantly, for me personally, it's a bike city. All right. Not the way to be back in a bike. Perfect, man. Yeah, Amsterdam. I love Amsterdam. Actually, Amsterdam is really my absolute favorite city in Europe. It is so cool. People are relaxed, right? And there's all this craziness going on. But on the other hand, really, it's just beautiful. Like, it's it's a great city and lots of things going on there as well. Nice. That is cool. So, um, do you already know when you're going to make the move? No, it's uh, we're brewing in our head a little bit. Um... We sort of move when we feel it in our gut that it's right, and then we just act. So hopefully in the next 18 months. Wow, perfect, man. That's a really, really great idea. And you want to stay in, in Europe, it seems. How about in the future? Do you want to try um, Tokyo, for example, sometime? That would be exciting, I think. Well, it's funny you mentioned. Uh, I'm a huge weeb, so you know I grew up watching anime. All right. My favorite food is ramen. I have a ramen patch on my jacket. I love I ramen, ramen, man. Patches, I love so. ramen. I would love to go to Japan. Me too. To, Me too, I would love really. I to live in Japan for a little time. Um, Same here. But I don't know if it's the right move for the country. All right. Maybe yeah, yeah. South Korea. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, lots of gamers, a lot of streamers, right? Probably probably would make more sense to go to Korea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I myself, I have lived in Asia for quite a while, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and it's amazing to live there. I mean, have you been there? I have not. No. Oh, All man. Asia, I have, I've missed out on. Oh man, oh man, you will go crazy. You just Don't have to go there. To <laughs> you will love it. You will, you're going to go crazy on it, man. I'm telling you. You have to go to Japan. You have to check out Taiwan. And uh, it's everything is fantastic, man, really. <laughs> well, one of my life goals is to go to uh, Yokohama and oh. go to National Ramen Museum. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's what that's, has to happen eventually. Maybe we'll do it together. Yeah, I mean, ramen is just unbelievable and especially the one that they sell in tokyo obviously i mean in japan obviously yeah cool yeah um i would like to know um about now we're getting to the end of the show what has been amazing and i would like to know um with your current startup which is like it's it's looking so great it's it's on the way to success you have so many awesome ideas with it um on the way to where you are right now, what has been the biggest struggle with Liv, with working on Liv, and how did you overcome this? I think building product hard, full stop, you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks along the way. On, a, on sort of an individual level, I think the hardest thing is keeping at it and uh, learning to deal with uncertainty. Fortunately, it's something I learned in the past. So for me, it's been easier and for other people in the company, it's a little bit harder. Um, but I got to say for VR specifically, what we found is talent really hard. And we have a really big advantage here because we have so whether or not we want to open source some parts of our work and have the community work on them, or if we want to hire directly through the, what we've done, all our hires, um, it's alleviated that problem. 
But in general, what you're looking for is people with a specific skill set who have true passion for VR and are willing to stick it out for the years that it's going to take. And that Venn diagram ends up being really small, especially when you start taking into account that companies like Vive, Facebook, the bigger startups will raise a lot more money and snap those folks up really quickly. So I think, I think talent acquisition is really the Right. That makes sense. But you, you made it happen. You have a great team now of four people who are com completely committed to what you're doing. And it seems like you're having a great time and you're very successful at what you're doing. Yeah, man, that was incredible. Thank you so much for this interview, for being guest in the very, very first episode of the People in XR podcast. This was Dr. Doom from Live, interviewed by Insomniac from MRTV. Right. <laughs> and yeah, just such a pleasure to have you here on the show. For everyone who's watching this right now or for everyone who's listening to this show, please, please, do yourself a favor and try out the Live app. You can get it from Steam and I will do so myself as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Doom. This has been amazing. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me on the show. You're welcome. Bye-bye. And that's it for this very first episode of the People in XR podcast series. I really hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I'm looking forward to see and hear you in the next episode.